Welcome to Terminal Value. So everything I do here at Terminal Value is based around one big question, and that is how do growth-oriented people transform their business and their life to achieve world-class levels of value in everything they do? That is the question, and I am here to bring you the answers. My name is Doug Utberg, and this is Terminal Value. I publish new podcast episodes five times per week. So make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any content. And also make sure to follow me on social. You can just look for the Doug Utberg handle. Please comment and let me know your thoughts. I'm looking forward to working together so that we can make your life amazing. Welcome to the Terminal Value Podcast. We have Ramona Shaw with us today, and we are going to be talking about succeeding in a leadership career transition. So what Ramona specializes in and kind of where her business operates is in both with individuals and companies who are transitioning from that individual contributor type of situation into a leadership role. You know, this is where I'm going to uh, kind of impute uh, one of my personal bugs here is that I think it's, to me, it's important to differentiate between leadership and management because to me, leadership is really where you get people to want to follow you, whereas management is usually when you are enforcing authorities. And many people end up well, not all, you know, not all leaders are necessarily managers and mm-hmm. not all managers are necessarily leaders, but there are a lot of people who, who overlap both. Uh, so anyway, um, you know, enough of my editorializing. Ramona, introduce yourself and let's get the conversation going. <laughs> Thanks for having me on the podcast, Doug. Yeah, so I'm Ramona Shaw. I'm a a leadership coach and the author of the book, The Confident and Competent New Manager and host of the Manager Track podcast as well. This is really, this is my passion. What I do day in and day out is helping managers reach that next level that could be moving from a director to a VP level, but it could also and often is but really transition in, transitioning into their first leadership role. So coming out of an IC position, being promoted because they yeah. were typically really good, high-performing ICs, and then noticing that, oh, wow, I may need to develop new skills here because now it's all about people and that leadership aspect, right? So like you said, it's a lot more, it, there is a combination yeah, that needs to that needs to be present with the management aspect and the leadership ac- um, aspect for it to really be successful for them personally, but p- maybe more importantly for people to want to work with those yeah. managers to feel like they're thriving in their roles. Yeah, well, and I think in the in the current environment, this is it's actually probably uh, even more important than it has been in the past because you know there are, there are a lot of people who are. Kind of, you know, because of quote the quote great resignation, you know, a lot of people are kind of checking out of their prior work environment and really looking for something new. And so I think that uh, you know, if you're going to retain talent, especially you know, high end talent, uh, having quality leadership is, I would say, probably more important than it ever has been. Particularly because uh, you know, with you know, at the time of this recording, uh, signs are putting toward an economic recession. So you will have not only the challenge of leadership. But also the challenge of leadership when you there's a decent chance a number of companies will be going through layoffs. That's a hard mm-hmm. time to lead. <laughs> really hard. <laughs> because, uh, lay- layoffs do not create high morale environment. And at least one of the things at least that I found is a lot of people who who I've observed because you know I was in you know corporate career for 20 years, and during a, a lot of people who are in leadership or I'll say man, I'll say management positions because leadership is something you do it's not a position but a lot of people in management positions kind of sort of stopped leading when the times got bad they just sort of kind of fell back on hr communications on like you know kind of email blasts you know on like big uh kind of big auditorium types of things and you know and then and org announcements and stuff like that and i think that is like literally the opposite of what you need to do in order to lead effectively uh, and again, I, I suppose maybe this is just some of my career trauma speaking, um, but but yeah, they just I've seen this kind of thing unfold, and I'm like, how in the world does anybody think that's effective leadership? It's you know, it's really it's just hiding behind a medium to avoid needing to really confront the reality. Yeah, so true. And what I you know what I often think and also see when it comes to you know news reports like this or when we observe people in in more of a public space uh, sp- sphere is it's 
not that leadership is easy at any point in time or management no. for that matter, but it's a lot easier to lead when things go well, when I'm in a growing economy and a growing organization, when we have um, really strong talent on our team and things are generally going well yeah. to lead. Well, that's, you know, you got to do the work still, but yeah. that's not necessarily where we'll really see who's doing it right and who is not doing it effectively. When th times get hard and we have to okay. convey really difficult news and we have to manage frustration, disappointment, sadness, right? Yeah. The, we really have to lean into that people side and be compassionate and help people understand what's going on, really putting ourselves into their shoes and their perspectives to exude influence in a way, but then also get people, you know, go through that journey and then get people back aligned onto that mission yeah. and get back up. That is when we really see who's got it and who's still struggling yeah. um, on that leadership journey. And I often say to my clients who are going through a transition, I say, you're not going to be measured based on what's going well, as much as you're going to be measured on how you're going to handle things when it gets tough. That is really where people and the eyes are going to be on you. And how are you going to lead when you have an underperformer? How are you going to manage something when a project fails? How are you going to handle it when you have to lay off people on your team? And are you going to get the rest of the team? How are you going to bring them back into the conversation and then back into a space where they feel engaged and motivated still to get through that difficult time. Got it. Yeah. I mean, and I think one of the things that you've just, uh, just touched on is those are really key indicators of effective leadership because it's, it's how you do the hard things, right. Mm -hmm. You know, and hard things are, you know, because, you know, like, well, I, don't, I remember, you know, when I, when I first led a team, you know, your, your initial thought is to say, Oh, everybody's great. But the truth is that there's always, you're always going to have underperformers. And so the hard part is going to be, okay, when you have somebody who is underperforming, how do you manage them through that process? Uh, and because there's kind of the camp counselor version, which is where, you know, just kind of, oh, well, everything's fine, kind of talk to them a little bit. And then you, what you end up doing there is you end up making everybody else pick up the slack for them, which mm. will kind of devalue team morale. Then you have like a hardliner who basically just cuts them off. So of course, what ends up happening there is, you know, you'll then you'll polarize your team because you'll have some people who are like also hardliners who are like, yeah, cut the fat. And you'll have other people who are like, whoa, <laughs> Hey, what's going yeah. on here? And so, you know, the, you, what you really have, you kind of have to bridge that gap where you have to, you know, let people know that there is a performance expectation that's not being met. Be very clear about what's needed and then provide feedback through the process you know, so yes. that if it comes time where you have to pursue a separation, then, you know, then you can do that. I would say most importantly with a clear conscience, but, you know, they won't necessarily be happy about it, mm -hmm. but at least they won't be surprised by it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that I felt, you know, was my responsibility as a leader too. When I had to go through this, I had a low performer that I needed to, to help move on is that I actually help them find their next spot, mm -hmm. which, you know, some people would say is not necessarily your job, but I don't, I don't know how you disconnect your, you know, kind of, you know, kind of how you disconnect your person from your role. And yeah. so, you know, that's, you know, for me, I would say there's even extra credit points for, for really kind of leaning in and then helping help them move toward whatever that next step is, if that is not on your team. Oh, yeah, totally. And which speaks directly to what you said, that leadership isn't about the title that you hold at this current yeah. moment in time. It is a long-term approach and, and an identity that we take on. So if you think yeah. not just short-term as of, oh, this is my employee today. And then the moment that they're out of the company, go on and I don't care. But instead you say, no, I'm leading and we've met and we've come together. And I see it as my responsibility to support you on your journey. And that doesn't end the moment that they move into a different role or the moment that you're trying to you, that you fire them in, in, no. the, in the worst case scenario. But really that transition in either direction, be this helping them find a role where their strength, their their resources are better matched with what is expected, or be this moving on and outside of your team because they're progressing and they have other opportunities that are actually yeah. serving them and their career better. And if you can be that support in the back, in the background and guide them and coach them and mentor, mentor them, then that becomes a long-term relationship often. Yeah. Or you leaving a mark on them that they'll benefit from for a long time period. And that's where true leadership 
yeah. really comes from. Completely and totally agree. You know, not, not to make the conversation about me, but uh, you know, one of the things that I've observed is that you know a number of people who were on my team from you know years ago, uh, you know, we've kept in contact, and then there are, there's a few where they'll be going through some sort of career situation, and we'll just get on the phone and start talking through it, just you know, just like it was ten years, you know, five ten years ago. That's really the mark of you know in my view, what leadership really is, it's because it's, you know, it's really where you are helping the people who, you know, who are working for you or working with you to continue in their own development. And I think the, in, in my view, and then that real next level of leadership is helping them to develop, not just into say what you need or, you know, kind of what the market needs or what the, you know, what the kind of the market says is going to be the next step for their career, but really developing into what and who they want to be for them. And mm -hmm. that may not always be a exact fit for what's going on in your team, which of course is, which is one of the other conversations that I, I remember having with a lot of my people frequently um, was of course, right. We'll say, okay, you know, we have a team, we have a job, we have to do that. I don't expect you to spend your entire career on my team. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about what is that, you know, what does that journey look like? And it may not, it may involve different team or a different company, or it may involve doing things on your own, but let's just understand what that looks like, you know, because then, then what I could do is I can help them to gain experiences that will be helpful in that transition. Cause there, there are a few things that are, you know, more traumatic than having to essentially build a full skill set from scratch with really no roadmap and no coaching. Yeah, totally. And while it's just the right thing to do, right, in the first yeah. place, that's the right thing to do. But also when we can connect whatever work we're doing today to, to their personal goals and yeah. their career ambitions, and we find alignment between what the company, the team needs versus what they need. And there needs to be yeah. an overlap, right? Otherwise, this isn't yes. the right match. But Correct. to look and hone in on that overlap and communicate that overlap, it may not be immediately visible. But you may say, you know, if you ever want to run your own business, looking at this and understanding this particular process will mm -hmm. help you because you're going to need to do this in the future. And yeah. so as a leader pointing out um, how, where that overlap is. And then it, that those things, those kind of conversations are incredibly motivating for people. Yeah. They feel engaged because they have a personal interest in this. Yeah. Yes. And, and I think I, the, I, oh, yeah, go. Oh, sorry. I, I was going to interject because uh, I had a thought that I wanted to throw up before, uh, before yeah. I forgot it. <laughs> One of the things that I've uh, come to learn is, uh, come to really especially learn is that, you know, if, you know, if, if running your own business, especially if you're going to be starting kind of as a boot, uh, bootstrap entrepreneur is your ambition. One of, one of the most important counterintuitive things you can learn is how to troubleshoot your own IT problems and create your own tech stack. Because especially kind of where I came from in corporate land, you have an IT department. And so it's like, okay, you know, I need hardware. Oh, I'm having trouble with it. You can just call it, call it and, you know, and get help, you get, get help from somebody. That's not how it works when you're running your own gig. You have to figure out how to solve your own problems. Now, yeah. of course, you're going to need to have a business that you run and all that other kind of stuff. But I think that's probably one of the easiest things to overlook is how to fix your own tech problems mm -hmm. because you're it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I do. I yeah. derailed the conversation. Please continue. No, going. but yeah, it's a really good point. But because it may not be obvious, right, to someone yes. in that role, but you having gone through it, you can yeah. point these things out, and that's incredibly uh, important and and part of mentorship. Yeah. I was going to say the, I think this genuine care. If I look back at the people who I consider to be the best leaders I've ever had, mm -hmm. I noticed they genuinely, genuinely cared from my success or about my success. And yeah. they would check in with me after I've left that position and would be curious on how I'm doing and how they can support me. And that is not something that we can fake in the moment. It really yeah. comes from a change in our mindset and our identity as a leader. And when we see ourselves not as someone inheriting a certain position, you know, anytime we transition into a new role and we think this is my title and I have to manage the people while they, they are at work, it's a clock in, clock out. That's a very outdated model. Yeah. It, because we no longer see ourselves as nine to five people. Most of us, and especially new generations entering the workforce, for them, it's particularly untrue that that yeah. we be, or, or they cannot relate to, stereotypically speaking, they cannot relate to this kind of approach. But we're, So we're looking at them as human beings, this is human-centered yeah. approach. But as a leader, that means 
I am looking at the people that I am leading as this is my team. And I want to genuinely look for their resources, their talents, their strength, what makes them unique, look for the values that they hold so that I can support them not only to be thriving and bringing most of that into my team, but also Mm -hmm. I see myself as a leader in a role where I, I want to support them and be a coach, a mentor, a guide yeah. for them in that phase of their lives. And yeah. then it's genuine curiosity and genuine care. And those are the things that make people feel very differently than if someone is kind of like, yeah, in and out, come and go, who cares? Yeah. Someone else can do this job. I don't yes. care who, who, what name you have and who you are. Yeah. Completely and totally agree. I mean, and uh, I think a couple of uh, at least just thoughts that I'd, I'd like to augment that with uh, is, you know, what at least one of the things that uh, that I found is effective or one of the things that I tried to do uh, to consciously avoid influencing people to put in extra hours on a regular basis. The reason being that, you know, my philosophy was always that there will come a time when I'm going to need to ask for night, weekend, some kind of extra effort. And if the normal situation is extra effort all the time, every week, you don't have any more to give. And, but there's going to come a time when it's, you know, it's not just getting the, you know, getting the email queue cleared. It's not just, you know, getting the reports written or the standard operating procedures together. It's something that is like actually like really mission team business critical. And if that's the case and you don't have any extra capacity for people to give, then you'll start burning people out because you'll be pushing them from, you know, instead of from normal to, uh, in, instead of from normal to heavy workload, you'll be pushing them from heavy to insane workload. And p- if people go at an insane workload for very long, they'll just call it, they'll be done. And not mm-hmm. only will you end up with a toxic relationship, you'll also start ending up with a lot of, uh, you'll end up with vacancies on your team that will end up being really hard to fill. And so I think that's actually one of the other things that is really important to monitor uh, as a leader. And that also yeah. means you you can't have not just monitor it, but model it as well. Because if you tell your people, okay, you know, it's fine for you to be, you know, you know, I want you to only put in about, you know, 40 hours a week and they see you working 60 or 80, it'll be really hard to get them to avoid, you know, to not uh, follow after your behavior. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And one of the other sort of side effects of this is that, people who would value a really good work-life integration yeah. and they have their outside lives that they really ma- care about. And then they look at their boss who seems yeah. to have no no life or work yeah. until 2 p- two a.m. every every night and on the weekends. They may say, I never want to have my boss's job. I, I want to have my job. I don't want to have my boss's job and I don't want to have my boss's boss's job. So there's no career progression for me yeah. here. I'm going to go look elsewhere where I'm more aligned with my values and, and how I want to do work so that I can continue to see career progression within an yeah. organization that I'm with. And some leaders don't see that, right? So because they're so yeah. in that they may that may totally work for them and they feel like whether they have an option or a choice or not, that that's what they're doing. And even if they say to employees, you don't need to, employees see those things. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, that's a really important frame for looking at it as well is because, you know, as you said, the way that people will be thinking about what their career progression looks like is, you know, especially now is people are going to say, okay, I need to progress into something that will still work for my life. So like, for example, you know, my wife and I, we have two kids, our daughter's 16, our son's 13. We are at that time where there is an insane amount of activities, whether it's scouts for my son, whether it's dance for my daughter, you know, there, you know, whether it's, you know, say teen meetups uh, through the church, through the community, whatever, there are a ton of activities. And mm-hmm. one thing, you know, and if you are burning too much time on your work activities, you can, I mean, I suppose some people check out that has long-term relationship man- you know, uh, ramifications. Let, let's make the simplifying assumption that that's something that people who, who are on my team value. Mm-hmm. If that's something that I also value and I'm modeling how to make all that work, that shows them that there's a progression of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, when, when people feel that they're going to basically have to burn the candle at both ends in order to progress, they'll find someplace else to progress. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think I'm glad you're bringing this up because one other thing that 
uh, I always highlight for for people who, and I want to bring into a conversation with people who are transitioning into a new role, whether that is into their first leadership role or they're just leveling up and they're taking on more responsibilities or new, new team members. It's a lot easier to set, let's call them boundaries, to set boundaries in place from the beginning yes, than to do so later down the road. If you say, I want to close my laptop at 6 p.m., I don't want to work after dinner, and you start to implement this from the beginning and you say yeah. to your team, here is how I roll. Here is the work, how I organize my life. And th- yeah. this is important to me. I will not respond to Slack messages. Um, uh, call, I've got to call me if there's an emergency. But yeah. at 6 p.m. I'm out. I don't work weekends. Um, then people just know that's yeah. who she is. That's I'm going to work with what is in front of me and this is yeah. I'm going to adapt my my work hours or my communication with the person as they're laying out their uh, their boundaries or guidelines. But if someone doesn't do that because they think I got to prove myself, it often uh-huh. comes from this I need to prove yeah. myself especially for new managers. I got to show them the value because maybe there's a certain uncertainty underneath or uh, insecurity underneath. Mm-hmm. And then they say yes to all the things and they overcommit potentially or commit to the extent where they don't have good healthy boundaries in place and then six months or 12 months or two years or three years later they realize this is not working for me i really have to get better then at that point to go back and change it is a lot harder on one hand we know you know changing habits is harder than creating new habits and two other people will think oh my gosh what is wrong yeah right there's something that wasn't wasn't well and wasn't going well for her or something that we've done wrong and so yeah. for other people to deal with that is a lot harder too so really at that moment when you transition to really think about how you're going to be setting this up and be more conservative in the beginning and then loosen up as you go if things work out well versus trying to do too much in the beginning and then having to hone in because you realize it's not sustainable yeah I'm not sure that there's a response to make that would improve that last point. So uh, <laughs> since we're uh, since we're pretty close to time, if you have another last thought, please feel free to give it. Although I think that last one was really good, and let everybody know where they can find you. Give out your website and uh, your favorite socials. Yeah, my website is RamonaShaw.com. I am on LinkedIn and on Instagram, typically at Ramona.Shaw.Leadership. My book is a new, The Confident and Competent New Manager on Amazon. And my podcast is the Manager Track Podcast. So those are the, the main places to find me and learn more about the work that I do uh, with Out- individual leaders and with teams and organizations as well. Outstanding. Outstanding. Well, hey, Ramona, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for having me on, Doug. All right.